Uh, okay, so from now on, I'll probably have to do it like this. Um, I don't like using up class time to take attendance, and that's kind of why I was doing the attendance question, but I was just flat out having too many people keep marking themselves here, but then not come to class. Uh, or even the other way around, where people would come to class and then not mark themselves here. So I, I kind of have to switch it to this system now, which, you know, I don't like. Um, if you guys are able to, to join class a couple minutes early, then I could get attendance done before class starts, so we won't really lose any time. Um, so I'll just kind of, I'll have the waiting room thing on, and then when you guys come in the waiting room, I'll be able to take attendance that way. So even if you come late, um, it'll pop up and show me the, the waiting room, so at least I'll know you're here. So I'll, I'll be able to take attendance that way, no problem. I just, I didn't do it before because I didn't want to use up class time, but uh, I kind of don't have a choice at this point. So <clears throat> first thing is um, I put up, you probably got the, you probably got the message uh, that I sent to you guys. I put up the answer key for the test and then I opened the test up so you could see your answers. Um, I, I tried putting all the work with it so that you guys could see where you went wrong. The biggest, the biggest question that had issues was the uh, boat one, the boat one where it was, you know, the they were reeling in the rope with a winch, I think it was, and um, the the portion that a lot of people missed was that when you are reeling in the rope, the rope is getting shorter, so the rate of change of the rope is negative, and so when you got done, the the velocity of the boat would be negative 13 feet per second. And that was the portion that most every single person missed. Um, now, the actual question did ask for the speed. And um, there were only two people in the entire class who, who noticed that part. <clears throat> so the actual correct answer was positive 13. I would say a majority of everybody um, put positive 13 as an answer incorrectly. So even if you have 13, the main portion that I'm grading is your work. Because, because we're doing everything virtually right now, um, your work is pretty much everything I go by. Um, your final answer itself is only very few of the points. And so, uh, you know, a couple of you were kind of asking questions on your tests, things like that. Maybe you just did a lot of the work in your head. I don't know. Um, but the, the issue is I can't assume that, right? So if I have one student who doesn't know what's going on, but then writes the correct answer, maybe they got the answer from a friend. I don't know. Maybe I have one student who really knows what's going on, does a lot of it in their head, and writes down the correct answer. Those two tests would look the same from my perspective. And I'm, I'm not going to assume that you know what's going on or you don't, right? So I, I always try to, to grade my tests as unbiased as possible. And so I'm not going to say, well, this person usually has an A, so they probably know what's going on. I want to approach grading as fairly as I can. So if you're a person who's putting in a lot of work, um, you know, but had a bad grade, I'm not going to assume you are going to get it wrong, right? I'm going by the work that you show. And so I know that that can be annoying at times, but that's, that's pretty much how the AP corrects their tests as well. So when you do the free response on the AP test, they are not going to assume that you know what's going on or don't. They are only going to go by what's presented to them. So, you know, I, maybe, maybe that was lost in translation between first trimester and now. I don't know. But, you know, going forward, I want you guys to realize that that's, that's how grading is, is done, is it's virtually all the work. Your final answer is, is very little of the points. Um, thank you, Jackson. I had scrolled down and so it didn't show it. Um, but Finley is not up there. 
Oh, now he is. <laughs> Thank you. Apparently there's downsides to this system. Uh, okay, so why don't we get going on, on today's work. Uh, yesterday we just, we, we approached the one topic and we did the mean value theorem. And uh, once you understand and get the mean value theorem questions, they're all very much the same, no matter how complicated they are. They all have the same setup. And uh, that's going to be the same for this topic. So, uh, you know, if you guys are trying to compare the work we're doing according to Khan Academy, it may look like we're going really slow. Um, but the but the reality is, so critical numbers, the topic that we're, we're going to go over today is such a big idea that we're going to use it for a lot of different things. <clears throat> and so this is only one little blip in the assignments in this unit. But this is not something that I'm going to rush through in any which way, because if you understand what critical numbers are, you'll see as we go forward that the same ideas are repeated through a lot of different things. And so I want to take my time and go over this one pretty thoroughly. And then starting tomorrow, we'll kind of start approaching topics. So a critical number, the unofficial um, definition, is it's just where something happens in your graph. Right, so I put I put four different types of graphs up there, um, you know, and they all have things happening. Right, so the first the first odd powered polynomial. Well, it goes up, then it comes down, then it goes up, so it basically changes direction twice, and that's that's what we would call or refer to as something happening. So an absolute value of a linear function, well. It changes direction, so something happens there. Uh, this is an absolute value of a quadratic. Uh, same thing. It actually changes direction three times. It goes up, down, up, down. And so there would be three different critical numbers on that picture. And then this is like an x to the fourth or something like that, where this particular one also changes three different times. <clears throat> now, you, you'll notice that I kind of have them marked in like silver and white, right? So, that's supposed to be a zero. I don't know the best way to write that. Basically, the only way that something happens in a graph is if your slope is zero or your slope is undefined. So when I referenced changing directions, well, if your slope is going to change from positive to negative, a positive to a negative number has to hit zero somewhere in the middle, which is kind of mean value theorem. Um, and conversely, that's for differentiable graphs. If you have a function that's not differentiable, it may have an undefined slope, like a sharp point, where your graph could change directions. So, this is a good definition. It is not the definition written with notation. Critical numbers will happen when the first derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Now, if, if we were in the classroom, what I usually do is I choose one person in every class, and they are designated as the expert. So like <clears throat> critical numbers, right? So like this definition is going to be used a million times, this unit. 
And so I can certainly scroll back up quick. I'm assuming this part. Yep. So what I would do is I would choose somebody in class who's the expert for critical numbers. And anytime I call on somebody in class and they don't remember what a critical number is, we refer to the expert. And this expert will help us remember what critical numbers are. I don't know if that would work great virtually or not, because it just kind of slows things down. <laughs> you know, when we're all together, it's really easy. But what I'm hoping you guys are going to do, if you're using your own computer, put up a virtual sticky note and put the definition of critical numbers on there. If you're using a your Chromebook, I don't think they have a sticky note app, but who knows. Um, use an actual post-it note. And you're going to want to write little things down that we're going to use a lot this unit. This is one of them, is the critical numbers. Uh, do you have what you needed, Kelly? You bet. Okay, so critical numbers is when the first derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Uh, underneath, I wrote critical points. So I don't like how Khan Academy uses these two words interchangeably a little bit. Because I think the title of their section is critical points. But there's, there's a big difference. Okay. I mean, it's, it's an obvious difference, but still. Critical numbers, if you see this term, if you see the term critical numbers, it refers to x values, like x equals 3, x equals 4. Critical points refers to the actual point on the graph. So on the AP test, these two things are different, and so you have to answer them differently. Um, let's go with, let's, oh my gosh, we have 37 today. Let's go with Natalie. Wait, Natalie, I didn't mark you down. How the heck did that happen? Natalie, are you there, or is your mic work? Okay, excellent. What do we have to look at to figure out if it's equal to zero or undefined for a critical number? Important fact. Uh, true, true. Um, when you read the definition of critical numbers, what are we trying to figure out is equal to zero or undefined? Perfect. So this isn't this isn't like underlined or highlighted or anything, but this is the thing that you're solving. So make sure you don't accidentally make the original function equal to zero undefined. It is the first derivative. So here I've got two separate problems that we're going to go through. And who knows, maybe you need a reminder on how to do this. <clears throat> um, but thank you, Natalie. Uh, da, da, da. Let's go with um, uh, Tara. On the one written in green, uh, what should we do? Should we take a derivative? Should we solve it? What should we do? Nice catch, nice catch, good. Okay, how do we like physically make something equal to zero or undefined? I shouldn't say physically, but like, what do we actually do? Oh, okay, that will be how we'll solve this one. Um, what I was looking for is, so I, my guess is you just did it in your head. Some people are actually, have a hard time understanding what it means when it says 
when the first derivative is equal to zero or undefined. It means you're going to write the first derivative equal to zero. Um, what you said was, was perfect. So this is a quadratic equation so that we would try, probably try to factor it first. Um, and this one does factor. Wait, yeah, minus 4 plus 1, yeah. Factoring only works if it's equal to 0, which is kind of handy for us because that's what a critical number is. And uh, if you, oh, go ahead. Correct. Nope. Yep. No, that, that would be something different. F prime of zero would g be just to find the slope at x equals zero. We're, tr we're trying to figure out when the slope is zero rather than what the slope is at zero. I know that can be absolutely confusing. When you have it factored, you will set each factor individually equal to zero. Now, I, obviously, I picked uh, an easier question for you guys to start with, just so we could refresh you on ideas. So then, what we if we were asked what the critical numbers were for f of x, not f prime, and we are not going to write this every time, but. So the critical numbers for f of x would be x equals 4 and x equals negative 1. Uh, da, da, da. Connor, Connor, if you were asked to find critical points, what would you have to do to find critical points? Yes. Perfect answer. Yeah, we can't do it on this one because we don't know f of x. So if you were asked for critical points, you would take these x values and put them in the original function to find the points. Nice answer. Okay, good. Um, do you, I don't remember what the one below it is. Ah, I'll have you try the next one on your own. Let's do the pinkish colored one together. <clears throat> okay. Um, if you have a rational, so this is already the derivative, you know, I guess we should say that first. If you have a rational expression, it's actually kind of set up easy to figure out when it's equal to zero or undefined. So if you think of fractions, You did. You answered it correctly. So if we're looking at fractions, uh, Jackson, Jackson, yeah, we'll go with Jackson. What would be the answer to every one of these fractions? Yeah. And so what you're supposed to take out of this is what's the only way that this rational function could be equal to zero. Still Jackson, unless you don't know it, and then we can call it somebody else. Yeah, but I don't know. Oh, you're trying to give me a specific number. <clears throat> so any rational equation, what's the only way that you can have zero as an answer. Okay, but you understood you understood it down here, right? What do they all What do they all have in common? Good. So, what would be the only way that this answer would be equal to zero? So, 
Same answer you just gave down here. The only way you can have a rational expression equal to zero is if the top of the fraction is equal to zero. Yep. We actually don't care what happens to the bottom when we're looking for the derivative equal to zero. So if the top of the fraction is equal to zero, that's going to be a critical number because your answer would be zero. Um, Emma, what's the only way that you can have a fraction undefined? Because we're trying to figure out when the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. What's the only way that a fraction is undefined? And if you don't, if you don't know, that's fine. Okay, no, that's fine. I mean, I don't have a problem if you guys don't. Um, I mean, like the whole point of this is learning, so I'm just trying to, you know, a lot of times get you guys there. Uh, so if you guys don't know an answer, I, I don't have a problem with that because then that kind of lets me know what I should try to explain as well. Um, yes. There you go. That's what I was looking for. So for this one, it's four. But if you're looking for when a fraction is undefined, it's when the bottom is equal to zero. So on a rational expression, which is why I have this example. On a rational expression, the top equal to zero and the bottom equal to zero finds you where your derivative is equal to zero or where your derivative is undefined. because you can't divide by zero, so that would be undefined. And yes, this one isn't a hard one to solve at all. I just wanted to talk about it in general terms because you guys are going to have more difficult equations. So if you understand this idea, you'll be good. Okay, so I'm going to solve 2x plus 3 equals 0, and I'm going to solve x minus 4 equal to 0. So when x is negative 3 halves, or x is 4, although technically, if, if we wanted to use correct notation, we would probably say can't equal 0, you know? So when x is negative 3 halves and when x is 4, It's a critical number, but it's not a number you can use. So um, now if you guys remember, this is the derivative. So at negative 3 halves, the slope is 0. At 4, slope is undefined, which can look like a sharp point. Also could be straight up and down. It basically just means that there is no slope at 4. And we're, we're going to use these differently, so that's why I'm kind of taking the time to label them. You won't have to label them all the time. I'm just trying to do it for your notes. How, how are we doing on these two different kinds of problems? Is there is there something maybe that you would like me to explain more or different or anything? Mm. It's okay that you don't know that yet. We're going to use this for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different things. So I'm just trying to teach this uh, idea in general before I talk to you about how it's used. Because if you understand, if you understand critical numbers, um, once I talk to you about uh, how we use it and, and things like that, then it makes it a lot easier. Okay, why don't you guys see if you could do this one on your own? 
uh, should be semi straightforward. Um, who should we go with? Um, now I forgot. Madeline, do you go by, do you go by Maddie? Right? Okay. <clears throat> what, uh, what would we do first here? Good catch, good catch. So this is the first one that you were not given the derivative. So yes, that is definitely the first thing we have to do. Uh, so what do we have? 12x cubed minus 12x squared. Okay, uh, do you want to keep answering or do you want to call in the next person? Uh, sort of. I mean, that will be part of it. What do you have to do before you factor it? Well, no, no, no. I mean, that is the factoring part. Uh, what I was trying to get at was you have to make sure to write equals zero. Otherwise, it's in, like, it's, otherwise it's showing wrong information. Yeah, fa the factoring part was, was correct. Uh, so yes, the 12x squared would be the greatest common factor. x minus 1. So I'm going to set this equal to zero, which will still be plus and minus zero, and one. Uh, okay, Maddie, uh, what next? Oh, uh-oh. Do you want to call on somebody then? You can either pick on your friends or pick a random. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I was trying to ask that. <laughs> uh, what are we trying to find? Okay. So what do I do next? So I'll, I'll, I'll just say, what you had mentioned is if we were asked to find critical points, then you would take both of these x values, put them back into the original function to find critical points. So um, how do we find critical numbers? We have. Are are we done? Are we done? Or what do we do next? <laughs> okay, the reason I'm asking this 
is because a common issue for students in Calc is they just kind of like do stuff. And then sometimes they don't really know when to stop. They just kind of like keep doing stuff. And uh, I actually have quite a few people get questions wrong on tests because they just kind of keep doing things and they don't really know what we're doing. So sometimes it is 100% important that you guys um, kind of know what to do next, which sometimes that can be nothing, like you're done. Um, and so in this case, finding critical numbers is when the first derivative is equal to zero or undefined. This one doesn't have any undefines because there's no division. And these two numbers would be the final answers. These are the critical numbers. And that's what we were looking for. So we would be done. Yeah, I, wa I wasn't necessarily trying to trick you guys. Um, frequently, that's kind of partially how I approach asking on problems. How about this one? Uh, did, did this one go OK for a lot of people? Probably. I, I, I guess the main thing is if you remember to take the derivative to start with, because I bet a few people possibly just factored the original one. OK. Uh, should we move on to a more difficult one? Probably. Let's do that. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, Nick. Nick, I sent you a message, too. Okay, we have two levels of difficulty left. Do you guys want to try this one on your own, or should we do it together? All right, try it on your own. And if you get to a point where you feel like you're just totally stuck, then, you know, get as far as you can. And then we will do it together and talk about how to, like, go past that. That sounds good to me. We, we shouldn't have a problem getting in the last two problems before the end of the hour. Uh, I'm sure most of you are at this stage where you have the derivative. So I thought I would put that up there to make sure you have it correct. Um, basically, the only difficulty of this problem is just how to solve this, which is where some people have troubles.
So before we go through the answers on this one, um, does anybody think they have the right answer? Like, I kind of think I, I wouldn't mind just writing down, you know, different solutions people got. And you can write it in the chat or say it aloud. I'll just kind of put down the different things people got. Okay, Mandy, what'd you get? What'd you get? X equals. So we've got zero. We've got X equals one and zero. Uh, we have X equals plus and minus one and zero. Okay. And just a negative one. Okay. But I, you've got a decimal. I was just going to say, at, at least everybody's kind of consistent on the numbers you're getting. What decimal did you get? Zero. That was a lot of numbers. Let's just go with 0.7. We'll make it small. Okay, that's all right. This also is kind of helpful to me to know what type of answers you got. This one's a little bit of a tricky one, which is why I picked it as an example. So that's why I was kind of curious what you guys ended up with. Um, I mean, they're all right together, so that's not a bad thing. All right, so there's, there's a, a lot of different ways to solve this. So I don't necessarily want to say you have to do it this way. Uh, what I would do first is I would add that to the other side. Uh, you could factor out the 2, but that just doesn't really benefit anything. Because like on this step, I'm going to divide by 2. So I've got 1 equals x to the negative 1 third. <clears throat> From this step, there's two main ways that people would would solve it. Uh, one way is I would bet some people wrote this as 1 over cube root of x, something like that. And if you did that, if you multiplied both sides by cube root of x, then this would say cube root of x equals 1. Then you cube both sides, and then you get 1. Okay, uh, another route you can take is if you leave it like this. So down here we cubed both sides, and I think a lot of people are familiar with this method because you know in your head that cube root and cubed are opposites, so they cancel out. Well, I can, I can take that same idea here. If I take both sides to the negative third power, x to the negative one-third to the negative third power would be x to the first. So they're opposites. And then 1 to any power is still 1. So solving it these two methods would give you the same answer. Uh, I'm wondering if the, the people who ended up with plus or minus 1, I'm wondering if they wrote plus or minus here, thinking something along the lines of square roots or something like that. So this one was just positive 1. And then, oh, see, this is why I needed to pick an expert. Um, Ari, how do you feel about being our class expert on critical numbers? Just tell me what, tell me what, do you remember what a critical number is? Okay, perfect. You're the expert. So every time I call on you, that's what I'm hoping you can answer. <laughs> so the reason I'm going with this, um, Joe, Joe, all of this work I just did, what was that to find? Only equals zero. How do we determine if it was undefined, Joe? Undefined is, are there any numbers that I can't put in place of x? How about right there? 
because we had a negative power in the problem, we actually can't, a negative power means a fraction. So we can't use x equals zero because a negative power is the same thing as a denominator. And so it doesn't show up anywhere and you don't really write it down anywhere, but you are going to have to look for undefined values. They are by far the most annoying parts of critical numbers. So zero and one would have been the correct answer. And honestly, if you got zero and one, that's pretty awesome. I was expecting, you know what? Nobody even wrote positive one. <laughs> I was expecting most everybody to get positive one only. I was expecting a lot of people to forget zero. Where did the negative one come from for um, others? Was was it what I what I said when like something with the cube root, thinking that it was negative? Because I I know I saw that on a few. Is anybody willing to volunteer up where a negative came from? Or is it just like errors and factoring or something? I don't know. All right. Uh, you think, <laughs> I think I just can't do algebra. All right. Uh, sh should I? Um, what you're going to find shocking is when you guys get to college and you've got these big, giant classes, right? Like the Kelt classes in college can have like 200 kids in them and they're in auditoriums. So they're almost considered like the general classes. Um, you have these crazy smart professors. And you're going to find that those professors are so smart that one, they have a really hard time explaining to you how to do something. Because in their head, their head just works like so fast that they just know how to get answers. And they're going to have a hard time explaining things to you. And two, they can't do algebra at all. Like their arithmetic is, is by far the worst thing you'll ever see. You're basically going to be correcting your professor all the time. And it's, it's weird how it's like a universal thing. Every college has them. It's just these professors who are smoke, so smart, they can do ideas in their head, but they have such a hard time doing arithmetic. So you will find that out. So I'm not going to hold it against you guys. I mean, like, point-wise, yeah, I'll hold it against you, but uh, it's it happens to everybody. All right, let's go to the difficult one, then. And this one's only difficult because you guys hate trig. It's not difficult on its own. It's just difficult because you guys hate trig. Um, maybe we should just walk through this one so we can finish it in the 12 minutes and be done. Um, I feel like... I feel like uh, Dane... Dane has it in him to tell me how to start. Good, good, good. So we need, wait, uh, Ari, what are we trying to do again? Yes, yes. Remind me what a critical number was. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. So we need the first derivative to be able to do this. Um, and you'll notice that I started writing the wrong information because talking and, and working at the same time doesn't go well. So derivative of sine was cosine. Derivative of cosine of 2x. Well, that would be negative sine. So this turns to plus. Same angle times the derivative of the angle. Ugh. Yes, ma'am. Different. So the the spot right there 
is the angle size. And what we're trying to do is find the ratio, the cosine ratio of this angle and the sine ratio of this angle. Our huge problem is that they are different angles. And every single thing that we ever do for trig, we have to work with the same angles. So in this case, you're going to have to refer back to pre-calc and use the double angle identity. This is on that formula sheet uh, that I have posted for you guys if you want to use that. Otherwise, you can just Google it. So everything has to be the same uh, angles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change sine of 2x into 2 sine of x cosine of x. And then now they have the same angle. And I'm going to make some room here. My derivative is this. Uh, I will tell you guys right now, on the AP test, they do not expect you to know this replacement formula. And I am not expecting you to know that replacement formula. So you will see it. You'll see it occasionally in homework questions. I am not going to put this on a test and it's not on the AP test. So it's not like something you have to have memorized. And so that's kind of why I'm just saying to you guys, if you run into something like this, just Google it if you need to or look up the formula. But it's not going to be shocking if you see it in your homework. I mean, it's it happens. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I want the derivative equal to zero. Mm. Uh, Jessica, can you quickly tell me how we normally solve trig problems? Because this one we can't do a normal way. How do we normally solve trig again? Okay, um, so a regular trig problem that we get will say something like sine of x equals uh, a number, right? So normal trig problems, uh, the replacement formula is called double angle identity. Uh, you probably can just type sine of 2x into Google and it'll probably pop up the info. So normally, we have to have a trig function equal to a number. Well, we absolutely don't have that here. <clears throat> so you're going to have to kind of like uh, be creative sometimes and, and solve things. Uh, I guess what I'm looking at is they both have a cosine. So if they both have a cosine, we can factor it out. Yeah, yeah. If they both have something, that's the whole idea about factoring out. So I'm going to factor out 2 cosine of x. And I'll be left with 1 plus 2 sine of x. And this this absolutely looks a lot better for us, because each one of these is, is kind of like a little mini equation to solve, which is definitely possible. So I want to know when cosine is equal to 0, and I want to know when sine of x is equal to negative 1 half. So I'd subtract 1 divided by 2. <clears throat> to solve trig, it has to be the trig function by itself equal to a number. Uh, okay, cosine of 0. Uh, see, cosine is 0 at pi halves plus 2 pi n. <clears throat> and 3 pi halves plus 2 pi n. Do you guys need me to refresh you from pre-calc what these answers mean? Okay. The coterminal answers. So if you're looking at a unit circle, cosine is equal to 0 up here and down here. Uh, so this is called the first, like, primary answer. So pi halves, and then it would happen, a 
a full circle later on top again. So 2 pi n uh, is how you find coterminal answers. So like n equals 1 would be uh, 5 pi n. And we, we write them like this because we're not sure we're not sure what the interval is yet. Like maybe this would say 0 to 4 pi. If it says 0 to 4 pi, then you would list the answers that work. Uh, okay, so sine of x. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you'll definitely get trig ones. What you wouldn't get on the test is to need to use the double angle identity. Oh, you'll... Trig? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's always. Whenever, whenever you guys look at the unit circle, that's what this is. So, if you are asked to look from 0 to 2 pi, then you'll only use these primary ones. So the 2 pi n isn't a factor if you're, if you're only looking 0 to 2 pi. The plus 2 pi n is every possible answer. Like if you're looking at a graph and the graph goes forever, this is how you get all of the answers. Uh, cosine is equal to 0 up here and down here. So pi halves, 3 pi halves. Um, I, it, it depends on if you learned it with a unit circle or if you learned it a different way. It might have depended on who you had as a teacher, etc. I, I do things a little different, so I'm not going to try to... Uh, you do not, Julia. On the AP test, they give you nothing. It's horrible. That's why everybody thinks it's the worst test ever. Uh, unless you're taking it at home, and then you get everything. Okay, so sine... Sine is one of these reference triangles, uh, the opposite side. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So to be negative, it would be the bottom. Negative 1 over 2 happens at both of those spots. And this would be a 30 degree angle to get a negative, to get 1 over 2. So sine's answers. Let's see, this would be pi plus pi sixth. So 7 pi sixth is the first answer. And if we needed more than 0 to 2 pi, that's what the 2 pi n is for. Um, maybe, to, maybe in the future here I'll try to pick one that's not 0 to 2 pi so we can talk about how to use 2 pi n. Um, and then this angle is 30 degrees less than 2 pi, so that is pi sixth less than 2 pi. So that would be 11 pi sixth. Uh, also, <clears throat> the 2 pi n is because sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi. If this was a tangent answer, this would say plus pi n, because tangent has a period of pi. Okay, well, um, we, these are the answers we were looking for, because we were looking to find when these were equal to zero. There is no undefined answers, because sine and cosine are both continuous functions. There is no, there is no undefined spots. So our four critical numbers would be pi halves, 3 pi halves, 7 pi 6, 11 pi 6. And it is basically... Oh! Uh, you do not. So I'll just quickly show this part. <clears throat> the, the whole idea behind the plus 2 pi n um, is that you just write coterminal answers. So pi halves would be your starting point, and then I would add 2 pi onto that. So add 2 pi would be 5 pi halves. I'd add 4 pi halves, um, and then I'd add 2 pi onto that. And then I could go forever, and I could also go in the negative direction. So like if n was negative 1, 
then the one prior to this would be negative 3 pi halves, and then subtract 2 pi again would be negative 7 pi halves. The 2 pi n just tells you how to find all the coterminal answers. Our only solution from 0 to 2 pi is that one. So this is, this is just a way to get coterminal answers. And I'm, I'm writing it like that because depending on how um, correct you'll see notation, it depends what notation should we use for our answers. Um, your critical numbers can only be from 0 to 2 pi. So we only had to find them from 0 to 2 pi. So that's... I don't really have a good answer for you, Mandy. I don't want to tell you guys you have to use super perfect notation because um, I don't want your brain to be on overload. So I, I will always do my best to show you correct notation. Um, and like when we're getting to testing situations, I will, can we use the notation of the brackets? Uh, I'm not sure what that notation is. Oh, like s s set notation? So like this is how you'd write the answer? Sure, that works. Yep. There's a lot of ways to write things correctly, so it's kind of annoying. Yeah, that would work. Sure. Okay. Nope, not one bit. Not one bit. So the AP, you don't even have to take the AP test. Uh, and, and to be honest, you can take the AP test even if you don't take this class. This class is just, this is a normal calculus class, but I will also prepare you on how to take the AP test at the same time. So that's why they call it AP Calc. Um, you, but the test has nothing to do with the grade. I mean, they're, they're completely separate. Yep. It's weird. Uh, if you if you get a passing score on the AP test, then most colleges will accept that um, as passing their class. And depending on which college you go to, they they take different scores. So like uh, University of Minnesota, I think requires you to get a four. So if you get a four on the AP test, then you don't have to take AP Calc AB at University of Minnesota, and it counts. So it's just college credits. <clears throat> but honestly, if you're going into a major that requires calc, they won't accept it anyway because they want you to take it there for their major. It's it's really only a, it's it's kind of a scam, in my opinion. <laughs> I actually would prefer CIS rather than AP, but it's not my choice. All right, I, I'm done for today. Uh, you know, I appreciate you guys coming. Uh, you are welcome to come to the help session later if you want. Otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow.